In section 3.2, we'll now look at example 9. This is a very common style of problem within probability, and this kind of deals with probability based upon some kind of stratified table. In this particular table, what we see is we have a particular population that's broken up into two different types of strata. We have gender, male and female. We also have the um, type of major, whether it's not nursing majors or non-nursing majors. For example, if we look at this row, this row would give us the, the number of males. There's 1,255 males altogether. 151 of them would be nursing majors. 1,104 of them would be non-nursing majors. Okay. If I, for example, maybe pick on and focus on this column, we would see that there's gonna be a total of 2,797 non-nursing majors. Those non-nursing majors are broken up into the males. There's 1,104 of them. And the non-nursing females, which would be the 1,693. We could also get a sense for the total amount of individuals altogether. The total number of individuals that participate in the survey would be 3,964. The first question says, suppose that we randomly select a student, find the probability that they are a nursing major. For this, we can do the classical model of probability. It's going to be the number of nursing majors. The number of nursing majors, that's going to be this column total. So that's going to give us a total of 1,167. Out of the total number of students altogether, that's 3,964. And if we divide and compute that, we should get 0.294. In part B, we're asked what is the probability that the randomly selected student is a male? So we want to take the total number of males. That's going to be this row total. The total number of males is the 1,255. Divide that by the total number of individuals altogether. That's 3,964. And that will give us a probability of 0.317. Let's take a look at the next example. It says, find the probability that a randomly selected student is a nursing major given that they are a male. Okay. Now this is very important, especially as we move into this sec the end of the section and the beginning of 3.3. The, the key words are very important, whether it says the word given or an and or an or probability. You want to kind of look for those keywords because that will tell us how to proceed. In this case, it's a given, they use the word given, which makes it a conditional probability. So we're looking for the probability of a nursing major given that the student was a male. So we already know up front that this person that was selected was a male. And what that allows us to do, we don't have to consider the entire population. We can restrict our attention to only those individuals that were males. So we would already know at this point in time that the individual we selected was one of those 1,255 males. Now, if we have one of those individuals the probability that they were a nursing major, well, there's 151 nursing males that were there. So the probability would be 151 divided by 1,255. In the last example, it says find the probability that a randomly selected student is a nursing major and a male. So this time we're looking for an individual that has both of these qualities. They need to be both a nursing major and they need to be male. Well, all together we see that that's referring to this group right here. There was 151 individuals that were both nursing majors and males. That was out of our total of 3,964. So that would have a probability of 0.038. Let's take a look at the next one. The table below shows the results of a survey in which 90 dog owners were asked how much they had spent on their dog's health care the previous year. This is yet another stratified table where it's kind of broken down into different groupings. In this case, it's the amount spent on the dog, whether it was less than 100 or more than 100. And it's also broken up into the types of breed, whether the dog was a purebred or whether they were a mixed, uh, mixed breed dog. 
The first question says, find the probability that more than $100 was spent on the dog's health care. So if we're looking for more than 100, all together there's 50 dogs that had more than 100 spent on them out of the total of 90. So that would have a probability of 50 divided by 90, which is 0.556. Part B asks to find the probability that given a randomly selected owner spent less than 100, find the probability that the dog was a mixed breed. So right off the bat, that you say the word given, that the, dog, the owner spent less than 100. So the moment we know that the owner spent less than 100, we're now looking out of this subset of this population. So we know that the dog that was selected was one of these 40. Of those 40 dogs, the number of them that were mixed breed were, nine, see, were, were 21. So the probability that a randomly selected dog was a mixed breed, given that the owner spent less than 100, would be 21 out of 40, and that's going to be 0.525. In Part C, we're asked to find the probability that a randomly selected dog owner spent $100 or more and the dog was a mixed breed. So now we're looking for both 100 and more and mixed breed. That's referring to these 15 dogs right here. They meet both of those descriptors. They're both mixed and 100 or more. And it's those 15 dogs out of 90. 15 out of 90 would round to 0.167. We finished section 3.2 by kind of going back and revisiting a very specific case of our rule of the complement. In particular, we saw in the last section that the probability of the complement of an event would equal to one minus the probability of the event. And if we look at one particular event, in particular, the at least one event happens. And at least one event can oftentimes happen in many, many, many ways, which makes the direct counting of that event kind of complicated and involved. However, the complement of at least one, in other words, if it is not the case that we have at least one, then that means that we must have none of that thing. And that is often a much, much easier calculation to do. So because those two events are the complements of each other, we can compute the probability of an at least one event by doing one minus the probability of none of that event. And this is how we'll always handle the at least one case. It's a specific rule, or excuse me, it's a specific example of our rule of the complement, and sometimes we call it the at least one rule. To illustrate this principle at work, let's look at the following situation. Let's suppose that a person in the U.S., the probability that they have type A plus blood is 0.31. So if 31% of the U.S. population has type A plus blood, then that would have probability 0.31. Suppose we select three unrelated people, that makes the events independent, and they're going to be randomly selected and tested. Let's find the probability that all three of them would have A plus blood. So the probability that all three would have type A plus blood means that the first person has to have A plus, the second person would have to have A plus, and also the third person would have to have A plus blood. Because these events, these people are unrelated, their blood types are going to be independent. So this is simply going to be the probability that the first person has A+, plus, that's 0.31, times the probability that the second person has A+, plus, times the probability that the third person has A+, plus. so it's 0.31 times 0.31 times 0.31, which would equal to 0.030. If we wanted to find the probability that none of them, that none of the three have type A plus blood, then the probability that none have that would mean the probability that the first person doesn't have it, the probability that the second person doesn't have it, and the probability that the third person doesn't have it. Well, we know that 31% of the U.S. population does have type A plus blood, which means that 1 minus 0.39, to me, 1, point, 1 minus 0.31, which is 0.69, would be the probability that a particular individual does not have A plus blood. Therefore, this probability will be 0 0.69 times 0 0.69 times 0 0.69, which would give us 0 0.329.
And now we're asked to find the probability that at least one of the three has type A plus blood. Again, this calculation, even at this level, would be kind of a little bit tricky if you try to compute it directly. At least one of three would mean one or more. There's multiple ways that one person could have type A plus blood. It could be the first, second, or third person. Or you could have exactly two people have A plus blood, two out of the three. Or you could have all three out of the three people have type A plus blood. But an easier approach, instead of computing the at least one, we know that from our at least one rule, the probability that at least one has something is equal to one minus the probability that none of them have it. And that part is what we figured out in the previous portion of this question. The probability that none of them have type A plus blood was 0.329. Therefore, the probability of at least one having it would be 1 minus 0.329, which would be 0.671. Again, for us, anytime you hear that at least one, always use the at least one rule. At least one probability is equal to 1 minus the probability of none. We'll finish section 3.2 by looking at example 12. Let's suppose that we have 16 batteries that are going to be tested. And we know that of those 16, four of those batteries will fail the test. Let's select two batteries at random without replacement. Find the probability that both batteries fail the test. Now this is a situation because we're doing selection without replacement. This is going to lead to dependent events. The probability that both fail the test would be the probability that the first battery fails the test times the probability that the second battery fails the test given that the first one has already failed. When we do our first selection, the probability that we pick the first battery that fails, that's going to be 4 out of the 16, times we now need to pick a second failing battery. Well, if we've already selected one without replacement that was failing, that means we have three failing batteries left out of now 15 batteries. So the probability is going to be 4 out of 16 times 3 out of 15, which should work out to be 0 0.050. If we wanted to find the probability that both batteries pass the test, well, keep in mind that if 4 out of 16 fail, that meant that there must have been 16 minus 4 or 12 good batteries that would pass the test. The probability of picking the first battery that would pass would be 12 out of 16 times the probability of picking a second battery that would pass the test would then be 11 out of 15. According to the multiplication rule, we multiply those values together. 12 out of 16 times 11 out of 15 would give us 0 0.550. The last part of this question says find the probability that at least one battery fails the test. Again, we pick up on the keywords at least one. We know that the probability that at least one fails would be equal to one minus the probability that none would fail. And another way to say that none of the batteries fail, that's equivalent to saying that both of the batteries pass. So this is simply going to be one minus 0.550 which would be equal to 0 0.450.